Thank you, Zach. Thank every, everyone. First, I owe you an apology. Last month, I was supposed to give this talk, and uh, well, you wouldn't have wanted me here. I had a 101 degree fever, and I was hacking all over the place, so, so not, a, not a fun event. Okay. So let's go ahead and explain who, how many here do not know what Cube is or what we do. Ooh, new people. OK. All right, Cube is a company that I started in 2018, and we design and build satellites, specifically for Earth observation. Oh, he's project louder. Got it. OK. It is a stage. No, I'm not that good. All right. <laughs> I'll do my best. We build satellites for Earth observation, and we're doing it right here in Lancaster using techniques that vary from open source all the way to micro miniature electronics. So when we talk about satellites, we're talking not onesie, twosie like you see other companies do. We're talking 400 satellites monitoring the Earth simultaneously. That's passing over every potential point on planet Earth every 15 minutes. That's what we're doing. We're doing this for the environment. We're doing it for the um, agriculture, for insurance. And of course, hopefully, we'll make a little money while we're doing it. Okay. This right here, this will be hard to see for some in the back, but right here is one of our satellites. I have to be careful. Um, on Earth, they're very fragile. But with the exception of all the fun things that stick out from this, this is the real deal. Okay. We've learned the hard way. Don't put the real solar panels where people can touch them. Okay. They're, each one of these squares in real life is $400. It's nothing like seeing the bill when you have to replace these. Okay. Also, these are where our uh, patch antennas go. And again, very expensive. If you put your fingers on it, the oils will dissolve the metals on orbit, and then it stops working. So we don't bring those out in the public anymore. Again, ask me how I learned. Um, we do launch. We have a rocket. Well, we have a satellite on Firefly Alpha right now. It's standing vertical at the pad. It was supposed to launch last night, 1 AM this morning, our time. And they called it off. Something about Vandenberg not liking the winds. So now we're moved to June 30th. If all goes well. Mind you, this flight is 18 months late. If you want to be on time in the rocket game, Forget it. There's no on time. It doesn't happen. Everything moves to the right with our schedules. Okay, let's see if this will actually play for me. Come on. Wakey, wakey. I know you're there. Ah. How many of your boxes are on the flight like, super damn early? We have one right now. Um, it is an advanced demonstrator, and hopefully it does what it's supposed to do. Um, there we go. All right. So. Serenity 3, we built this for teachers in space. It is a student project-led satellite. The only problem is sometimes when students design experiments, they don't think about all the details of space. Here's one for you. If you build something out of aluminum and use stainless steel screws, what's going to happen in space? They'll actually electrically bond, and now you can have a short across your entire system, and they will weld. If you have parts that are supposed to fly out, like you're in a, in a deployer and this thing all folds out, and we use aluminum and steel at the same point, they will weld before it gets out the door. Yeah, nice getting a package from the students that had aluminum held together with stainless steel screws. So that had to be rebuilt. Um, most of our satellites are made out of a composite material rather than metals to avoid that very issue. And when you see the word net, that's no earlier than. <laughs> so when they say, oh, it's net June, June 30th. All right, it's going to launch. On no, that's no earlier than. Could happen sometime in the future. And I've seen that net move from 2022 to 2023 to 2024. Okay. Eh, it happens. Our next set is the Aurora Mission 1. That has four of our satellites on board, four of these, which are, I have to say, it, some pretty advanced tech in a little box. If you don't understand satellites, I, I will exp I'm going to run through a couple of things real fast on what satellites have inside them, this one in particular. This thing has on board a camera capable of 5 meters per pixel resolution. It has a full ADCS, which means it can rotate in any direction in space. It has a 26 watt solar collection system, 46 watts of battery power on board. It has an ion thruster, vacuum arc, which is specifically to move it from point A to point B so we can change our orbit if necessary. 
Oh, and did I mention that all of this is based on Raspberry Pi? Okay. It's a Raspberry Pi with edge computing hardware attached to it, and we wrote the software custom for it. Three years in the making. That's going to launch on Skyroot Aerospace, and notice that net Q3 2024. Again, this was supposed to launch about a year ago. Okay. So why open source for space? Well, the, one of the main reasons, and I'm going to go backwards, it preserves your startup cash when you're doing this. Okay. For example, there's a program that you're supposed to use, supposed to use for simulation called Orbital STK. That piece of software for the starter set is $40,000 per year, per person. That's why they add a zero to all these numbers. Okay? It helps you preserve cash. And there are open source equivalents for a lot of these tools that are expensive. They're not as well developed because they are open source but they have significant advantages. One is development time. It's already out there. You don't have to completely rewrite from scratch all the software you need. Okay. We use a program called gpredict, and I'll show that later. It's a great idea generator. We looked at uh, a piece of software that is an operating system specifically for satellites. It wasn't where we needed it. But it gave us the idea on how to change Ubuntu to be the operating system we needed. Um, many hands make light the work. I really firmly believe in that. Um, there, no one programmer can know everything unless you built the system from scratch. Would everyone agree with that? We've gotten beyond the one programmer era. It's over. Actually, it ended somewhere around 1991, 92, back when I was writing video games. The more people who are working on it, looking at your code, the better your code can be. You find the bugs, you get them fixed. Am I telling you anything of open source you don't already know? So I thought, all right. So this is some of the stuff that we're using for space. Kubos is the satellite operating system I was talking about. Um, it became, it was a commercial product, went open source, went back to commercial, but they left the open source component. And this is a wonderful piece of software if you can get it to work. It's Linux based. It's not quite real time, but there are modules to make it real time. And it's been a wonderful little OS to learn from. No one's been working on it for six months because the total number of people working on this software worldwide is about 14. My company is now bigger than the entire open source community working on that OS. That's sad. We try and contribute, but we haven't pushed anything up in a few months. gpredict. Has anyone used gpredict? All right. You can find satellites. This is an open source piece of software. Um, I, there's a laser on here. Yeah, this one right here. Um, this piece of software connects directly with Celestis and the 18th space group out of Vandenberg. So when we launch satellites, do you think they just get to go up there and nobody know what they're doing? Uh, no. Everybody knows what we're doing. That is the rule of the land. You do not hide what you're doing up there. Why? Anybody got an idea as to why you won't, don't want to hide anything? Collisions. Collisions. You do, yeah, you can't spy. You can't, well, actually you can if you know what you're doing. But, um, <laughs> I mean, we're hard enough to find as it is. Imagine if we went dark, okay? Uh, but we need to know where you're at. When you see on, on, in space how they're always making those maneuvers and the ships are going slow, and you're like, oh, come on, dock already, right? 250 meters off the port, and it takes them almost three hours to get here, 250 meters. Well, that's because the angular velocity of those two vehicles if you're off by half a degree, you just collided with the space station at better than 60 miles an hour. Half a degree. At 17,500 miles per hour, you don't want that. So you definitely don't want one of these hitting the space station, right? <laughs> um, we'd have a bad day, and the space station would have a dent in it. 
Actually, that's not true. That would blow a hole through it about the size of that ping pong table. Everyone would be dead in about four minutes due to loss of ox oxygen. So we don't want collisions. That's the number one reason why we track everything. But this is open source. You can go download this, you can put it on your computer. Mac people, you're going to have trouble. Ask me how I know. Uh, but it does work. It downloads the information right after our launch. Within usually 48 hours, we have our TLEs. You can track our satellite in real time. You can see what it's doing. Oh, and you can listen to it, too. It has a ham radio piece on board. So you can actually tune in and listen to what the satellite is saying. Okay. NASA is probably one of the best places to get software. Okay. Their code set is amazing, and their engineers are working on it constantly. Some of their flight simulation software for orbital mechanics is the best. Remember that $40,000 package I talked about? Well, we get it for free from NASA. You just have to have a Windows computer and Java to run it. OK. I can do that. What is it with the European group and how long their URLs are just to find a piece of software? <laughs> um, yeah, see, code.nasa.gov, easy to remember. ESA.in. They have some good tools as well. One of their best tools they have is a scatter plot. That is, if you do have a collision, what's going to happen afterwards? What's going to happen to your satellite when it hits the atmosphere? These are things you have to think about before you even start construction. Anybody ever see the news article about the poor family that had a nice little piece of metal come crashing through their house? Yeah, apart from the space station. They threw this pallet off. It was supposed to burn up. Um, again, engineer, I want to know why they thought this. They made a cable routing piece out of Inconel. Inconel is like the second or third hardest metal there is. Tungsten is the worst. And they thought, oh, that'll burn up in Earth's atmosphere, weighing 1.8 pounds. And uh, it lost 0.4 pounds before it hit. So, ah, simulation's important. And, the, and NASA has some really good tools for that. ESA has some really good tools for that. These are all great things. And I have no idea how much time I have left. Who, is anybody watching me? Oh, 10 minutes. OK, well, then we're going to speed this up just a little bit. OK? Now, there's lots of good with open source. And here are the, the bad. They are not open source software friendly at the Department of Defense. We wrote a little tool. We plan to open source it. And they said, um, no, we're using that. And yeah, it's in our satellite. It's part of our open source. Like, not anymore. And what they say goes. All right, I've twice in my life, for different reasons, none my own fault, I have had the guys in the black suits and the dark sunglasses show up at a business I was working at, and it's not a pleasant experience. I don't want to happen, have it happen again. Do not muck with them. Okay, when they take it out of the open source, it's out. Okay, so your finished product, you do all of this, you put it together, you go through their entire review process, and they say, oh, that's ours now. Thank you very much. Means there's no downstream opportunity for anything you build for DOD. We changed Kubos OS. We use it in a product that the Air Force uses. We're out. There's no open source version of that from us now. Okay. And development is unfortunately slow. As I mentioned, these things are outdated. There aren't a lot of people in the space game. The people in the space game need to talk to the folks in the software game. They all need to get together and work. Because there's a lot of stuff that's done that are engineers who are really good at designing hardware, and they don't know the first thing about writing software. Okay, so how many hardware people in here? How many software people in here? Okay, how many of you do both? That's what I thought. Okay. Hardware's hard. Hardware's hard. 
So there's minimal activity on these projects, and I would encourage anyone, if you want to get into space, besides talking to me about you know, a job at my company, look at some open source. We need your help. Desperately, we need your help. But it is possible, and it does make for some great tools. Okay. And with that, I'm just going to take the rest of the time and say, well, if we have any questions about what we're doing, questions, comments, or disparaging remarks, all are welcome. The craziest fun we've ever had. Okay. Um, in addition to satellites, I happen to love high power rocketry. Anybody fly the little Estes rockets? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I currently have one in my shop that I'm building. It is 12 and a half feet high. It'll go to 30,000 feet when it's finished. Okay. So why not just take the entire satellite company and we're going to have an outing at Maryland Delaware Rocket Association. Okay. where their rule is you build it, you fly it, but it's on you. I said, yeah, we'll go down there. We'll stop at the Roadkill Cafe. We'll grab some chicken. At least I think it's chicken. Um, and we will launch some rockets. And these, this crew got to see firsthand what these rockets do. And there's an adrenaline buzz when you're launching a rocket, and it's like three, three blocks from you, and it explodes. Okay. That's probably one of the craziest things we've done is we were there when this rocket decided to take off. Now, mind you, it's carrying about 90 pounds of propellant on board. It's 23 feet tall, and one of the engines goes out. And so it does this. <laughs> okay. Crashes, catches fire, and yeah, that one's kind of crazy. Yeah, I think that, that one, that's not the craziest, but I can't really say some of the really crazy stuff. <laughs> um, Let's just say it had something to do with a seven watt laser, all right? <laughs> we'll leave it there. Other questions? None. None about open source. Or what we're doing. Okay, there we go. That's actually one of the things we ran into with our second flight. Okay. We built a satellite, it was called Challenger, and it went out the door and it froze to death thanks to the wonderful world of thermodynamics. Okay. Every simulation said we were going to have trouble with heating, so we didn't put anything in it and froze to death. Thermodynamics at this scale don't work like the big scale stuff, so all the models don't work here. So in order to insulate it, we had to invent, this is patent pending, a technique that allowed us to siphon the heat off of the, the, the chips themselves to keep the system alive. Do that without metal. But yeah, we actually have a, a, a proprietary system that we've created. Eventually, we want to open source that too. Right, because like you can here we've got atmosphere. Everything radiates the atmosphere. Okay, despite what everyone thinks, space is not cold. Space has no heat, and that's a very di okay. Yeah, I know it sounds funny, but there's a, it's a very specific scientific reason for that. There's no heat, so no heat, no way to transfer heat, and so your chip will literally melt itself to death, while the rest of the spacecraft and your batteries freeze. So take the heat from the place you don't want it, put it to the place where you do. Usually use heat pipes, and those are 3D printed out of titanium, and we avoided doing that. So, Other question? Do any of your software people come here that we don't know about? <laughs> I really, um, <laughs> you guys probably, okay, so Rich Everts works with us pretty heavily. Um, a couple other folks do as well. I'm trying to get them more here at, to, to show up. And, and They're very shy, okay? <laughs> is, is there anybody here who is not an introvert of some sort? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. All right, I'm gonna... I'm, <laughs> how, many how many engineers do we have here? Bonafide engineers, okay? I'm gonna tell a joke that might be offensive to you. I'm just warning you now. Hmm? How, oh, pardon? What are your credentials for being an engineer? I got stuff in space? 
Okay, well, no. <laughs> hey, do you build something? Do you build something? Do you follow a process and it's a repeatable process? Yep, congratulations, you're an engineer, okay? What's the difference between an introverted engineer and an extroverted engineer? Anyone know? Oh, I wish that were true. <laughs> Someone tell my wife. Um, no, the extroverted, extroverted engineer looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. Okay? I'm an extroverted engineer. It was a push. Other questions? There was right here. Yep. Uh, Halos up to space. For Blue Origin, I helped invent the canister they use for the experiments on board Blue Origin, and they don't fly enough, and it's only suborbital. They have yet to even fly orbital. By the way, they're two years older than SpaceX, and they haven't flown a rocket to space yet. <laughs> Sad. Um, as far as SpaceX, they own the market. But if I want to get on SpaceX in 2027, I need to book it now, and I need to pay cash, and it needs to be $375,000. Oh, and then it's $60,000 for the interface to actually hook to it. Oh, and then it's another $25,000 for the electronics harness that's going to connect in. Oh, and then it's another $70,000 for the insurance that goes with that. But do you get your security deposit back? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the money goes one way out, OK? Um, there are other launch providers, all right? Skyroot Aerospace, we have um, Firefly, hopefully. Um, Innospace, Astra is out, Relativity went back and retooled everything. So the, the rockets that we were promised didn't show up. And that's a big, big issue for us, especially when our investors want to see progress and I can't get a ride. I mean, Firefly, that ride was booked three years ago. It's 18 months late. Ouch. We have a distributed system. So remember I said this runs on a Raspberry Pi. Okay. But uh, that's the CPU. Each one of the sensors has its own microcontroller that is independent and it has a watchdog to it. So each one of these sensors is a watchdog to another one. And the sensors, because of the microprocessor, it knows what it is. So we built a satellite that has plug and play. We can build a new sensor, write the software for it, create the firmware, get it all together, and the CPU doesn't need to know diddly about it. Okay. You plug it in, you power it on, the CPU says, hey, I don't know what you are. It says, oh, that's fine. <laughs> This is what I am. And here's the code to run me. Drops it into the API, and now it's ready to go. So the redundancy be between each of those microsystems and the CPU and another watchdog. And on top of that, we have a watchdog that watches the watchdog. We use 2040s. Raspberry 2040s. It's a custom board that we design. We call it a Cubico. As in Cube Pico. I don't know, my guys. Um, but it's an amazing little gadget because we, we stack them in. It, it, I can teach anyone in this room how to build one of these satellites in a day, and you can start cranking them out to a day without issue. The supply chain's the problem. But that is like Legos. It almost snaps together. You put all the pieces in, you add the screws, you turn it on. I know I'm definitely over by now, am I not? But at, as I'll go as you, tell, you tell me to stop, so you better. <laughs> uh, yep, we've actually incorporated it inside the, the, the frame itself. Oh, interesting. So that was one of the other issues we came across and that we ended up with framework that was bulkier than it needed to be. Okay. This thing fully loaded is 1.7 kilos. Okay. So under four pounds for an entire Earth observation satellite. Our next closest competitor weighs 17 pounds to do the same thing we're doing. 
Any other questions? Let's say the president calls you. <laughs> okay. You want me to put a, a, a rover on the moon? It's just got to roll around and take pictures. Yeah. OK. Um, can I, let, let me let you guys in on a, on a secret. We've already thought of that. OK. This system, remove these solar panels. We'll take these solar panels and these um, antenna off. We have a different solar panel that's going to clip on the side. We replace these two sides with two that have motors on them and attach the wheels. That's it. The motors are driven by the, the Picos. The Picos inform the computer, I'm a motor. What motor are you? I'm for front starboard. OK, all done. It's a rover. So like a week or two, you're saying. <laughs> we like to say about 45 days. I could turn one in 45 days, seriously. Net, yeah. Net 45 days. Net 45 days. <laughs> No earlier than 45 days. Yeah, someone's catching on. Good. All right. So yeah, it, it can be done. When you start thinking in modules, just like software, I mean, we created modular software for a reason, did we not? You're supposed to be able to pick it up and move it wherever you want to. Same thing here. You can pick up the sensors and move where you want to. Oh, we come up with a new satellite design? Who cares? As long as the backplane's the same, we're good. Nothing changes. All righty. One last questions? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. You've been great.